So, as always, when we organize the Rare Disease Day, it is a great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Stem Cell Institute and the College of Pharmacy, Dean Welich is here. Jim Cloyd is the pioneer on that side of the equation. And you are here to not just listen, but remember what has been done over the year that led up to this day. And also with all legacy of this rare disease day that we have done here in Minneapolis, there's gonna be a momentum and energy that's gonna come out of your discussions next to the posters. When you ask Dr. Wilson questions that he cannot answer, embarrass him, it's difficult. He's one of the smartest people I know. And uh, remember that as a, as a point in a, in a punctuated equilibrium, in a gradient of science in medicine. Because what you and I and everybody else will experience in the next decade, unless you have already seen it, is that the medical inflation is not owned by anyone. Government has not been able to own it. Private sector has not been able to own it. And there's really not a good answer to how effectively translate the basic science to clinical practice. And when I look back at the history of medicine, I pick up a date. We have celebrated President's Day a couple of weeks ago. And I say, Washington's birthday. That's when medicine stopped being magic and started on being science. So when was Washington born? Anyone? Oh, you are my hero, whoever you are. <laughs> Thank you. You have to know that. My 10-year-old knows that. So 1732, things changed. And uh, the science has created what medicine is. And uh, it is the enormous burden and enormous opportunity for us in this room. Because it does start with the loose grouping such as this one, where true advance starts. How are we going to own the ability to translate the basic science, the science that is the foundation of medicine, to something that means something significant for our patients and their families? And the urgency is real. The urgency is not just this is the right thing to do. It's not just the social justice of it. It is also what I see in my practice, and I specialize in bone marrow transplant and treatment of rare disorders by cell or gene therapy. It is the disappointment of the patients, of the families, of the community, our inability to actually deliver on all of these things. And it stays with me almost daily and informs much of the things I do in the lab and in the clinic and in administration. So with that, you will see today, and you have seen today, that the science can be combined with the art of medicine. Because compassion is the foundation of all medicine, any good medicine that I've ever seen. It is combined with actions, with policy that is both prudent and judicial. And with beliefs, with beliefs and values of people that take care of the sick and are sick. And that's why that combination to pursue the diminishment of suffering in someone, some community, or in general in mankind, is still a noble profession and an honest one when done right. And that is why I am so glad that I can introduce my friend Jim Wilson to you today, because he is an example of exactly that. He's a professor at the Paramount School of medicine, but he's more than that. For for last three decades, he has been the thought leader in the area of gene therapy. He has, in 1993, started what I think is the first and still the largest group of gene therapists in the world, and he has stayed at it. 
You know, he has the staying power of getting through hurdles and challenges and complications in a way that I have admired. And he's been recognized for this by receiving, for example, the William Osler Award for the patient-oriented research in 2014. And he lives what he does. He has a bicycle team that on a national level competes and raises money for orphan diseases. He has a program, Health Through Fitness in Orphan Diseases. He is a man that can span the complexities that I mentioned from science to art of medicine to policy and to the values that we represent. And he has a couple of things you know, that he says or writes. One is disruption in medicine. And I think that that is, that is essential, existential, you know, to be able to handle the entropy of new ideas. And the second one is, quote unquote, future is now. And I can think of no one better to talk to you today about that than Dr. Wilson. Please welcome Jim. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. Uh, for that incredible introduction. And when I had the invitation to come to Minnesota on Rare Disease Day, it's an invitation that I didn't hesitate for because so much of the pioneering work in cell and gene therapy has come out of this institution. <clears throat> My task today is to share with you uh, where we are with respect to the use of the broader platform of uh, technologies in treating rare diseases. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to also do that in a way uh, in which I illustrate uh, some of the challenges and some of the successes in uh, real life experiences. <clears throat> At the University of Pennsylvania, I run an orphan disease center, and I think the mission probably uh, captures what many of us believe uh, to be uh, the opportunity, which is this center develops transformative therapies using platform technologies that can be used in many diseases. And we will emphasize disorders with unmet need independent of how rare they are. We're, our view is there's a, a, not a disease too rare for us to develop a cure. And most importantly, to strive and to assure access to patients of all populations. Rare diseases are not unique to developed countries. Um, and we have an obligation that when we develop these successes that we do everything we can to assure broad access. <clears throat> Things have been changing over the last few years. As Jacob had said, uh, we all been uh, slogging away at this for many decades. Uh, 2017 was reported to be a breakthrough year for gene therapy by MIT Technology Review. And it was an incredible year, although it really represented the uh, efforts over many, many decades of many people, Minnesota, at Penn, and, and, and elsewhere. So it was a little anticlimactic. To the, 2018 was even better, and oh my, I can't imagine what 2019. We're on a different trajectory. So I've got a spectrum of concepts to share with you. Uh, I know this is a mixed audience of uh, those uh, that manage patients, scientists, parents, and children. For the children who are attending, I'm not going to give you an exam at the end of the lecture, but uh, the adults uh, better, I'm giving you a heads up. So um, the molecular basis of diseases I'm going to illustrate through a disease that I've spent my life studying, which is a urea cycle disorder, in which there's a deficiency of an enzyme called ornithine transcarbamylase. It's normally responsible for breaking down a toxic metabolite ammonia <clears throat> to urea. And if there's a mutation in the gene, there's no RNA made, therefore no protein, and urea isn't generated, but ammonia accumulates and it's toxic to the brain. So what is gene therapy for this disease? And we're going to get nuanced in the next hour because we've got to distinguish this from genomatidine and uh, another uh, treatment called mRNA uh, therapy. This seems so simple, and that's to correct the disease at its root. But you can't inject a gene because the gene won't get into the cell, <clears throat> the normal version of that gene. You've got, to you've got to encapsulate it in a carrier which is a virus. And if you can do that, it will get in the cell. It doesn't fix the mutation. It adds a normal version of the gene that makes the RNA, the protein, 
that then allows for the accumulation of ammonia to, uh, uh, to be diminished. So gene replacement therapy is not fixing the mutation. It's adding uh, the normal version of the gene that otherwise is defective. Really, the tools of our trade, uh, which have taken a long time to develop, are the delivery carriers. How do we encapsulate the gene and deliver it so that it will end up in the right cell and then in the compartment of cell, the nucleus, to express the gene? And if we do that, it'll be a resident to the cell for the life of the cell and possibly affect a long-term treatment or a, or a cure. So the concept that really established scientific foundation of the field came in the 80s when I was a postdoc at MIT, both in San Diego at MIT, and that's the notion of using a virus uh, as a carrier for the therapeutic gene that can deliver the gene to the cell and then to the nucleus, and then as, uh, as we noted in the previous slide, uh, express uh, the RNA and then the protein. And if the gene is uh, stable in the cell, uh, will continue to produce the protein, sort of like the Trojan horse. And this, uh, this delivery vehicle uh, is, was based on a virus. The one that has become popular and served the foundation of the field for directly delivering genes to patients <clears throat> is a virus called the adeno-associated virus. And this virus was discovered in, uh, in the 60s, and there were six of them discovered at the time. Uh, we, we really didn't know uh, whether they caused any diseases because they were an, an artifact and a carrier of studies on another virus. But one of them, called AV2, <clears throat> was developed as a delivery vehicle in which its pathogenic genes were eliminated and replaced with uh, therapeutic genes, kind of then delivering the gene, dissipating, and kind of a single hit. And if we could do this properly, obviate any toxicity but affect genetic uh, delivery. So why has this been challenging? <clears throat> and it has been challenging. It's because viruses do not effectively overcome anatomic barriers or deliver genes to the right cells. And a virus or a gene therapy version called a vector is a rather large entity, much larger than drugs that are developed as small molecules much larger than proteins. And when you inject a vector, it really doesn't go anywhere other than circulate in the blood unless we find tricks to get around it. So the, so the strategy for developing effective gene therapies is to overcome delivering the vector to the right cells. And there are several organs uh, that have been the topic of gene therapy that we're going to talk about today. One is to treat ocular diseases. And the barrier for overcoming delivery is simply to in the hands of a skilled surgeon to inject a vector in the back of the retina, creating sort of a, a bleb or a bubble that can correct the cells. But organs such as the brain, muscle, or the heart, there's a barrier, which is are your vessels that don't allow the vector through. So we've got to find a way to overcome that. The liver, though, creates a unique opportunity because the blood vessels of the liver have large pores. They're there for other reasons, but when you inject something in the blood, they can get to the liver cells. So we're going to spend a lot towards the end of the talk discussing liver as a target for innovative therapies because it, the delivery challenge is so uh, uh, diminished. So probably one of the most <clears throat> exciting and dramatic uh, clinical results of gene therapy was in the treatment of inherited retinopathies or children that are born without sight. And this was work that we started together with a very close friend and collaborator at the University of Pennsylvania, Gene Bennett, who then took this forward with uh, collaborators at Spark Therapeutics. <clears throat> what we showed in 1994 is we could inject a vector into the retina of mice and get gene transfer. We moved that to a monkey, where this is uh, looking through the eye into the back of the retina of a monkey that we introduced a gene that has a uh, that expresses a protein that glows. Gene Bennett then moved this into a dog model in which the dog had an inherited form of a disease that children may uh, have and showed that the dog regained sight. And then in a, really a seminal paper in New England Journal of Medicine 2008, 
Um, she uh, showed that in patients with this disease that following gene transfer they were able to achieve some uh, improvement in function or sight uh, that was meaningful for the kids. This moved into a registration trial and just a little over a year ago was the first approved gene therapy product by FDA um, in, uh, uh, in the United States. So com computer allowing, I'm going to show you movies of uh, a young woman bef with this disease called Leber's congenital amaurosis before um, gene therapy where she's asked to navigate an obstacle course reading the arrows that you can see that are down below her. And <clears throat> she's essentially off course there. Gina's anxiously awaiting over on the left. You can see her making sure she doesn't trip. Really profound uh, deficit, trying to sort of feel her way through the obstacle course rather than see uh, where she's going. And then after gene therapy, this is the same speed. Uh, this is uh, how she does. She, she clearly can see better now and actually can follow the obstacle course, doesn't bump into uh, the various different uh, obstacles, and uh, significantly Im improved her, her sight and her quality of life. I, I, I knew when gene therapy sort of came uh, of age was not by uh, watching uh, movies from The Rock where gene therapy causes craziness in people, but, but uh, a show called America's Got Talent I don't know if you remember that. One of Gene's patients, a young man who has a wonderful voice, was a finalist, and, uh, and, and he was able to regain sight, uh, and that was uh, portrayed uh, during his uh, time that he was on the show. So the blind man can see. This got the attention of, uh, of many stakeholders that maybe gene therapy is ready for prime time. But the problem was is those viruses that were discovered a long time ago while they were useful for the retina, were not useful for other organs. And the burden of genetic disease goes beyond uh, 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 deficiencies in sight. So two scientists in my lab, a postdoc at the time, Guanping Gao, and a graduate student, Luke Vandenberg, uh, together with others in the lab, sought to identify better delivery vehicles by discovering new viruses, uh, new forms of AV that may have uh, better properties in and fortunately, we're, we were successful in that, and there were a variety of tools that became ava available to us at the turn of the century uh, that we could potentially use to treat diseases that have their root in other organs. So I'm going to start in the central nervous system, although it's usually where I end, because I always thought that would be the most challenging, and, uh, and surprisingly not quite as challenging when we had the right technology as uh, many of us had thought. So the problem of getting genes into the brain is that there's a barrier uh, between the blood and the neurons in, in the brain. It's called the blood-brain barrier. Although if you do have possibly the right technology, it's possible that you could inject a vector into the blood and then it could overcome the blood-brain barrier and therefore deposit genes into cells of the brain or the spinal cord. Uh, other approaches uh, that we have been developing is to inject a vector into the fluid that bathes the spinal cord and the brain called the cerebral spinal fluid, either through a lumbar puncture injection into the ventricle or uh, a reservoir called the cisterna magna. <clears throat> we favor this approach, which is an injection in the cisterna magna that effectively delivers genes broadly throughout the brain and the spinal cord. This is an experiment we did in a dog model of a lysosomal storage disease called MPS7, in which we tested the concept of delivering genes to the brain and the spinal cord of a uh, vector that we discovered at, uh, around 2003 or 2004 called AV9 to determine whether it could overcome this barrier across uh, the brain and the blood, the blood-brain barrier. So we injected high-dose AV9 into the blood of these dogs and then analyzed uh, the uh, brain and the spinal cord for gene transfer, looking for evidence of this in a stain that stains all corrected cells red. We were quite disappointed that this was not very efficient when uh, delivering genes to the brain, 
but a certain subset of cells in the spinal cord really avidly took the vector up, and it turned out these are the motor neurons that innervate the muscles uh, out of the spinal cord. So possibly motor neuron diseases could be amenable to intravenous AV9. But if you wanted to get genes into the brain, uh, you needed a different approach. And when we injected tenfold less vector in the cisterna magna, which is in the cerebral spinal fluid, we not only had great gene transfer into the spinal cord, but very good gene transfer into the brain. Not 100%, but enough that may be useful. So when we think about treating neurologic diseases with gene therapy, what we've learned is that the motor neuron and the sensory neurons of the spinal cord are very easy to get genes into. Uh, other cells of the brain, um, cerebellum, midbrain, we can get genes into those cells, but it's not as efficient. Maybe about 10% at best. And the question is, is 10% going to be good enough? And each disease, uh, we need to evaluate that question and determine whether we can move forward with a treatment. And I'll share with you uh, where we're headed with that. The second, probably, uh, I think, the most, uh, uh, second most important development milestone in the field was the use of AV9 to treat a neurologic disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, this disease uh, is inherited, it's recessive, uh, and babies are born normally, uh, but they have a mutation in a gene that is important for the uh, vitality of the motor neurons that emerge from the cord to the muscle. And these begin to die much like what happens in ALS in older people. Uh, but they die at a very quick rate so that patients never really achieve any milestone and are diagnosed before six months of age and, and then eventually uh, die somewhere between a year to a year and a half to two because their muscles atrophy and they can't breathe and they have to be ventilated. Very reproducible natural history of this disease, but one for which there's no doubt uh, the need for something uh, to treat this disease. So AAV9 injected into the blood, if you remember from that experiment that we did in the MPS7 dog, can target the cells that are defective in this disease. It's the motor neurons. And so this is an experiment we did with an AV9-like vector injected into the blood of monkeys. And these are cells that we've introduced the gene into in the spinal cord of monkeys. So this may be translatable. A group at Nationwide Children's in Ohio, led by Brian Kaspar, then uh, evaluated this AV9 vector to treat a mouse model of SMA type 1. And um, this shows the survival that occurs without gene transfer, and these animals die within 20 days. And with a high dose intravenous administration of vector, you can get prolonged survival. So really, it was based on some of these proof of concept of experiments that they moved forward in a trial, and just about a year and a half ago, a year and three months ago, they published their uh, phase one data. Uh, and this represents 12 patients with a high dose vector. There was toxicity, and that's something we may want to talk about. Uh, but uh, it didn't seem to uh, have a permanent clinical effect on these patients. But the results were, again, nothing short of remarkable that, uh, first of all, all of them are alive, and their uh, lifespan should have been somewhere about a year to two and they all achieved some level of milestones. 11 out of 12 can talk, 11 out of 12 achieved head control, nine can roll all over, and, and what probably is just even beyond belief that two out of 12 can walk independently. And this effect continues, and we hope it's gonna last for a long time, we think it will, uh, but for families with uh, infants born with SMA type one, this is kind of a new good reality for them. This product is supposed to be approved by FDA in May of this year and then made broadly available. And I think the company has done a good job at stockpiling enough of this drug so that they could provide access uh, as, uh, as appropriate. So I want to talk about one other example of a disease that I haven't even presented any data before, but one in which we're quite excited about. Um, that's different than SMA uh, in its uh, pathogenesis, but a similar kind of clinical sequelae. It's called Crab A disease. And it's this broader family of storage diseases that I'll get into in a minute. But it's, uh, it's due to a defect in an enzyme called GAL-C, that as a result of that, there's an accumulation of these galactoceramides that accumulate in cells 
uh, in these characteristic sort of pathologic lesions that then lead to cell toxicity and cell death. Uh, it also affects, uh, there's an accumulation of, of cycosine here as well that may be toxic to the cells that are important for establishing myelin around neurons. So you get what's called a demyelinating disease and can get neural drop off. And this is just an example of what should be white matter in which there is a disease from an MRI of a patient with Crab A disease. So it's due to an enzyme defect, if you remember that first slide, that leads to accumulation of both the galactoceramide that can cause toxicity in the cell in particular, and then cycosine that uh, diffuses and can also be uh, neurotoxic. There, as, as with all diseases, there's a continuum of diseases. Uh, the most uh, prevalent form of Crab A is early infantile, and then there's a whole spectrum of those that are, uh, is onset as later. But early infantile Crab A, the diagnosis is before six months of age. It's 70% of all forms of Crab A. Uh, and somewhat similar to SMA, but the patients really don't develop any appropriate developmental motor neurons or psychomotor neurons, and they begin to uh, regress quite quickly. Uh, there's also a component of seizures, and prognosis is is about as bad as it is for SMA type 1 death within a couple years. The treatment, while it's marginal, but what has been attempted is bone marrow transplantation if you can get these kids really early. By the time they have symptoms, the bone marrow transplant is less effective because it takes a while for the transplant to seed the cells into the brain, and so there really isn't a, a good standard of care. The other 30% of patients have... Uh, less severe forms of this disease, late infantile, juvenile, or adolescent, uh, and again, uh, some similar kinds of effects, that when your uh, uh, neurons become damaged and you, you, and you lose myelin, that you lose uh, motor function, that then uh, it contributes to death. So again, the healthy cell would have uh, Gal-C, as depicted here by the uh, scissors, that then breaks down the, the ceramide versions and keeps them at check and also cycosine. But in a Crab A cell, you don't have the scissors and you get accumulation and you saw in that histology slide these uh, sort of pathognomonic lesions that can lead to disease. So we believe this whole area of storage diseases are really approachable by gene therapy using AAV. And, uh, and I want to illustrate that in the, in the next slide. So if we inject vector into the brain of Crab A patients, they all have disease. One out of 10 cells will get the vector and will fix that cell. But that enzyme is secreted and can be taken up by neighboring cells that then can take the enzyme up and correct those cells. So this is the key. It's called a bystander effect. If you look for the corrective gene, it's only in one of five cells, we think one in 10. But it, because it secretes an enzyme that can be taken up by adjacent cells, you can get a global effect and you can treat and effectively correct cells around it. So vectors in which we can achieve 10% correction of cells in the brain in this category of diseases may have global corrective effects. So just to give you some idea of data generated in support of moving forward in Crab A, that there are uh, two animal models that are available and clearly demonstration of uh, efficacy and safety in animals is essential and was really part of the early successes of gene therapy. There's a mouse model uh, in which, um, it's called the Twitcher mouse, uh, that has a defective Gal-C gene the animals develop tr a tremor, twitching, and eventually hind leg paralysis and requires euthanasia by the day of 40. They have CNS disease as well as peripheral nervous uh, system disease. Uh, unlike humans, the PNS disease is much greater than the CNS disease. But if you look at a peripheral nerve that should have myelin, these uh, have lost myelin because of their disease. I will say and many of the scientists would appreciate this, that uh, while mouse models are interesting, they're always easier to cure and treat than humans. It just is always the case, unfortunately. So you see a lot of successful mouse experiments that really don't translate to humans. And that's why we think a bridge 
is a larger animal model that isn't always available, but there is a dog model uh, in which the animal has uh, the same kind of genetic defect that was naturally occurring, in which this animal develops hind leg weakness, tremors, and the same demyelinating pathology, and it requires euthanasia somewhere between 8 to 16 weeks of age. And from a, from a pathogenesis standpoint, more, uh, it's more similar to humans. So we did some experiments in the uh, newborn crab A mice, where we injected into the cerebral spinal fluid through the, through the ventricle an AV vector expressing the human Galsy gene. These animals die uh, within about 30, 35, 40 days without treatment. And as we increased the dose of vector, we were able to show significant prolongation of survival uh, of the animals that was essentially half of the lifetime of a, of a mouse, which is about a year and a half. Now, how about if, a, if an animal had pre-existing disease, so they were quite sick, would, would the treatment be effective there? Because that may be the situation in which we encounter uh, in, in the clinic. And so this is uh, an injection of vector in the same kind of uh, mode uh, in animals that were more progressed. Uh, we injected the vector into the, uh, into the ventricle and then measured the level of Gal-C activity in the brain. This is normal. This is the deficient. You can, the deficient is lower. But we can actually overexpress enzyme using this approach. This is circulating enzyme. And then we did show a prolongation of survival. And during the time that the animals lived, they had norm, no, normal motor function. So this is a, a, a test in which it requires the animal to sort of hang on to a rod uh, and you need motor function. This is normal. This is the animals without treatment and these are the animals with treatment. And this is the demyelination. This is normal. You should see blue abnormal and we can reconstitute this. So we're able to show pretty significant increase in survival. Eventually the animals do die of some consequences. We don't know exactly what it is. It's not related to the vector but, um, uh, but maybe some other aspect of the disease. The standard of care, um, if there is one, uh, and it's somewhat controversial, if you can diagnose a patient early, that's usually if there's been an effective sibling and then another pregnancy at risk, so, so there's a diagnosis early. Before they have symptoms is bone marrow transplantation, and it's been met with some success. But that's really not relevant to most patients. So we ask the question, what if we combine bone marrow transplant with AV gene therapy, would it be better? So here we have in, in a mouse model, no treatment in green. We have bone marrow transplant alone, which is um, somewhat effective, but uh, not as uh, effective as what we had seen before. This is AAV alone, and then this is a combination of the two. We have some initial mortality from the bone marrow transplant, which is toxic to the mice, but it looks like we've created a significant subset in which there may be very long-term survival, so that may be an approach to consider. So here is uh, the work um, in the dog model. And this is, the, um, this is the untreated animal right about where we felt it necessary to euthanize the animal. And you can see the animal struggling. Tail was wagging a little bit there because it's out of the cage and interacting. And you can see the dog's lost all motor function in its hind limbs. Um, trying to grab, uh, grab a treat, I think. And this is you know, classic phenotype consistent with what we would see in humans. So a litter mate received uh, gene therapy soon after birth, and here's our rock star. We call it uh, Oligo. Uh, likes definitely to be out of the cage. I never seen a tail wag like that before it knocked the guy over. Um, doesn't want to chase the ball, but... Um, but we see no evidence so far of any tremors uh, and the animal really has normal motor function. <laughs> I figured this would be the rock star of the presentation, <laughs> Mr. Oligo here. And I'll just end it in a second. They're trying to distract him so he'll show how great he can run and uh, not really complying. I think they're gonna, they're gonna throw a bone, plastic bone, <laughs> saying, what the hell, that's just a plastic bone. I'm going out, sir. So. So anyway, 
I mean, this, you know, the, the experience in larger animals is really important for us to consider translation, so we're, we're really encouraged by this result and trying to move forward as quickly as we can in Crab A. So let's just uh, end by bringing together not only gene therapy, but all this other kind of new technology uh, in the context of a particular disease to try to identify what role will each play. We're going to get back to the uh, disease uh, OTC deficiency, which has its root in the liver. <clears throat> and the reason the liver is always kind of uh, at the nexus of many of these therapies is really the capillaries that perfuse the liver. <clears throat> And they have these pores in them. Now, our capillaries shouldn't have pores because they're there to prevent things to get to our other cells, like in the heart and the brain. But the liver has been organized so that it, it has pores to allow transport of nutrients. <clears throat> these are large enough that you inject something into the blood, it'll get on the other side, which are the liver cells or the hepatocytes. <clears throat> so the third disease we talked about, the blind man can see the SMA kids are walking and they're living, is a hemophiliac. And these are uh, is a genetic disease that affects uh, proteins, factor eight and factor nine, that are defective. It's X-linked recessive, so little boys are affected. And they, without treatment, they develop spontaneous bleeds, or if they suffer even minor trauma, they could bleed out and die. And there is a treatment, which is protein replacement, in that uh, the patients are infused three times a week with a protein that then circulates in the blood that allows a, a normal clotting. And it's uh, not only there's a burden of treatment, as you can see this young man injecting the infusate uh, uh, for preventing his bleeding, there's a pretty significant cost as well. So what is gene therapy? Well, if you start with protein replacement therapy, that every few times a week or frequently you get an infusion of protein. Protein is in the blood, it comes down, and the blood can sort of keeps and you're, and you're destined to a life of infusions. But if you can maintain therapeutic levels for most of the time, that these patients should have a normal life uh, span. But what if we took the gene encoding that factor, that protein, put in a vector, injected it into the patient, and actually deposited that gene into the liver cells, and that's what gene therapy would be. So a one-time infusion, and then a sustained expression of protein, so uh, that would prevent bleeding. Lily Wang in my lab uh, did an experiment uh, in a dog model. Again, you can see in each case uh, an animal model was important for uh, paving the way for a successful human experiment. And these are the levels of factor IX in this hemophiliac dog, initially injected with an AV2 vector, which was the first generation vector, and an AV8 vector that we discovered around 2002 that has more tropism for the liver. And you can see the level of factor IX following infusion of AV8, one-time infusion is high. It's therapeutic, actually. Uh, therapeutic be about 250. And it was present for the life of the dog, and the dog eventually died of natural causes. So this was then moved forward, really, by a, a couple colleagues who garnered the resources at times when, time when not a lot of people were thinking about supporting us in gene therapy, and uh, took the AV8 factor that we discovered, put a human factor nine into the, uh, uh, into the v vector and injected that into patients with hemophilia B. And this is the serum level of a patient with hemophilia B, showing that it went up uh, and persisted uh, and has persisted in these patients, I think it's six or seven years now. And there, I now count eight to nine companies that are trying to develop uh, gene therapy for hemophilia A and hemophilia B, uh, many of those using these kinds of vectors. So let's get back to ornithine transcarbamylase, OTC deficiency. Remember, as I mentioned, that, uh, that uh, what OTC uh, is responsible for is the conversion of ammonia uh, to urea. And when this is defective, uh, ammonia accumulates and leads to toxicity, neurotoxicity, coma. If uh, and this is X-linked recessive, so affects little boys. If there's no activity of OTC, the first time that the infant takes formula or breast milk, uh, there's a protein challenge, and they get very sick, and there's significant mortality if you don't know what the diagnosis is, about 50% mortality uh, in these kids. If they survive, you could potentially transplant them 
if they survive over a year, provide a liver transplant as kind of a form of gene therapy. <clears throat> we developed a mouse model uh, that's a phenocopy of this that has no OTC activity. Now, if there's partial activity, <clears throat> the diagnosis will be delayed. It could be delayed a month, two months, or it could be even in adulthood. It's later onset disease. There's no acute crisis. But these, uh, these older individuals are at risk if there's a protein challenge, like they have the flu, or maybe they uh, are not on their protein diet, that they could develop the same kind of episode of high ammonia, hyperammonemia, with significant uh, mortality. Um, so while there's a dietary and drug therapy to try to diminish the risk, they're still at risk of a lethal episode of high ammonia. And there's a mouse model that has a partial uh, uh, activity mutation called the sparse for mouse that we also have done work with. So I'd like to talk about this disease and, and, and evaluate the role that gene therapy may have or may not, genome editing may have or may not, in mRNA therapy. So um, this is an experiment we did in the mouse model that has the partial defect. So it's born normally. As long as you keep it off a high protein diet, it does pretty well and we injected different concentrations of vector into the blood and then analyzed the liver later for the number of cells that have been corrected. And wherever there is, uh, this is the, uh, the, the normal staining of a normal mouse, this is the sparse for ash mouse. And even at, well, these are relatively low doses of vector, you get a subset of cells uh, that are expressing the enzyme and in other experiments I'll, uh, uh, that I don't have a chance to talk about, that this is stable for the life of the animal. So if you inject a vector into an adolescent or an adult mouse, like in the hemophiliacs, you can get stable genetic correction. They have very high levels of uh, urine or uh, of erotic acid in the urine uh, at baseline, and in all of these doses it comes down and it's stable. So there's a stable metabolic correction in these animals, and this is for the life of the animal. So this is kind of like the, like the hemophilia experience where we're leveraging that. So we created uh, an AV8 vector <coughs> expressing OTC deficiency, uh, developed all the preclinical data, manufacturing, and collaborated with a company called Dimension uh, that is now Ultragenics, and they are in the midst of a clinical trial of uh, adults, and these are with partial OTC deficiency, single infusion of vector into the blood and they've reported uh, the results in both a low-dose and a medium-dose cohort where they're measuring uh, the ability of the urea cycle to break down uh, ammonia uh, or to produce urea, and, and this is the assay. So this is normal uh, in patients. This is the defective, so it's reduced, and, and, and these, are, uh, these are heterozygotes. So they're looking for some improvement in this, in this assay. And again, the paper hasn't been published, but one out of three patients in both the cohorts now are off any therapy, drug therapy or other therapy, and they have normalized their um, ureogenesis. And they think that if they go to higher doses, they'll be able to increase the number of responders to, uh, to more than a third, but at least a third so far, there's some result. But let's get back to not those that are born uh, with a partial defect that have an attenuated disease, diagnosed later, but how about the majority of patients that are born with a neonatal form in which they have severe disease uh, at birth? And this is the typical and very unfortunate trajectory of that newborn is they end up in a coma, they end up in, in the a neonatal ICU, and they have to be transported to a, to a tertiary care center trying to drive their ammonia down while they're trying to diagnose the patient. So we've tried to develop ways in which, in this disease, and this is really our goal, can we prevent this from happening? So when someone gets sick, get them out of this uh, predicament crisis. And secondly, to populate their liver with a gene so that they'll never get sick again. And those are the two goals. It turns out that they're, they're not really similar in challenges. So, we generated a mouse that had no OTC activity, and that animal died within 24 hours. This is uh, survival over time, usually within 18 hours, much like the, the kids. If we injected an AAV vector right away before they got sick, uh, we could reconstitute expression of the enzyme and get 
a partial improvement in their survival uh, at least for, uh, for 30 to 45 days. But then for some reason it lost its uh, graft, it went away. And then we tried to readminister the vector and we had some success. But in humans you can't keep giving the AV vector, we develop resistance to it. So, so we were wondering why in adults did we get a stable correction, but why in newborns was it transient? And you really only have one shot on goal here. Well, if you look at the expression of the enzyme in the liver of, uh, in this case, this would have been uh, the animals with a partial defect, uh, and this is a green stain. You can see within 24 hours, they do have some expression over uh, the baseline, and within 48 hours, it looks good. So we could see why there would be some short-term protection. But then if you follow them over time, four weeks later, eight weeks later, 12 weeks later, the expression went away. And that's not what we saw before. So some for some reason, when you inject one of these AV vectors into newborns, you get good expression, but then it disappears. And, and the problem is that in a newborn, the liver is proliferating and is growing. So what happens? Well, if there's a defective hepatocyte in a newborn, mutant gene, and we put the normal gene in, we correct it. But as the liver grows, the cells proliferate, and this vector is not integrated into the chromosome and it doesn't replicate, so that it's eventually diluted out, and many of the cells lose it, and you're only left with a subset that have the gene. So the way in which you can get a permanent graft in a newborn that has a proliferating liver is to fix the mutation, not add a new gene that's just floating in the nucleus. If you're an adult and your hepatocytes aren't proliferating, that's okay, because this vector can hang out in the nucleus and be stable. So this brings us now to genome editing, different than gene therapy. So genome editing is essentially to capsulate some technology that can get in the cell and fix the mutation. So here it is. You've probably heard of CRISPR-Cas9. Fix the mutation, make the RNA, make the protein, break down the ammonia. Now when this cell divides, it segregates its chromosome and the daughter cells will have the fixed gene. So our thought is, at least in newborns, if you want to treat uh, liver disease and patients that have metabolic crisis, that genome editing may be the way to go. So again, just to summarize, <clears throat> in gene therapy, we have a defective gene, but we add the normal version of the gene. And as the cell divides, the only thing it keeps is this. But in genome editing, we actually fix the mutation so that it's durable and uh, is represented in any cells that result from, uh, from division. So in a genome editing situation in the newborn, you have the mutation. Editing occurs. You now have a normal gene. And then every one of the daughter cells that result from proliferation have the gene. So you've heard about the CRISPR craze and and there are many other technologies, and there are different ways in which you can accomplish this chromosomal genomic correction. <clears throat> and the technology that, that we've uh, developed, we've worked with all of them, is what you have to do is you have to create a break in the chromosome where you want to fix the gene. That seems kind of crazy. Why do you create a break that could be mutagenic? Uh, but if you create a break and you also incorporate DNA that represents the normal sequence as it cell tries to repair the break, it'll incorporate the normal gene and you can get correction of this. Now this sounds pretty interesting. It turns out it's pretty easy to create the break and then actually to create a mutation. In fact, we've shown in monkeys we can do this in 90% of liver cells in, in adult monkeys. What's really hard is to fix mutations. And it's really only limited to cells that are dividing. So really well positioned for our scenario with with kids uh, with a metabolic disease and what you're treating newborns. This is just uh, some data of many experiments that we had done where uh, we had a, an OTC deficient newborn mouse. We in, injected this vector expressing the uh, editing constructs and then followed the animal over time. Animal survived, put the animal on high diet later. And if the gene engraftment persisted, then the animal would eventually suffer hyperaminemia and die. So untreated animals, 
that are then uh, exposed to a high protein diet, which are, represent these animals, uh, that they accumulate very high levels of ammonia and then they eventually die. But when we genome edit it as a newborn and then challenge later, the, ammon the ammonias are not elevated and we get complete survival and these animals then therefore would, would have persistent expression. So one last technology that I'm really excited about, you probably heard less about, that seemed a little crazy when I first heard about it, is something called mRNA therapy. So again, let's start with our OTC deficient cell. No gene, no mRNA, no protein. Gene therapy adds the gene, reconstitute the mRNA protein. Genome editing corrects the gene, reconstitute the mRNA and protein. What mRNA does is it circumvents this whole thing and adds the mRNA directly to the cell. It's delivered, mRNA makes the protein, breaks down the ammonia, urea. Now the problem is mRNA is not stable like DNA, so you have to administer it. But the one thing that's nice about mRNA is if you can get it into the cell, its onset is much faster because it doesn't require the step. But eventually you'll have to give it again. So it's more like a, like a traditional therapy. So we've explored this really in one setting, and that's patients in crisis. Is this a fast, easy, safe way to get OTC enzyme into their, pro into their liver cells and then to correct the defect? And, and this is an experiment where we injected the mRNA into, a, uh, into our newborn knockout mice and then followed them over time where, uh, where this is a control. And you should see red where there's uh, uh, RNA and protein. Within six hours, we can get all cells expressing. So we think this is very well positioned to treat newborns in crisis. And when we've dosed litters that had representatives of the litter who were knockout animals, we can get about 50% that, uh, that overcome that neonatal crisis. But eventually, you have to give the vector again, which would be the mRNA. And so just in the last slide, what we've done in, uh, in this model where we can preserve uh, their uh, survival. Untreated animals, uh, they die quickly. And then uh, wild type here, uh, this is weight. And then if we keep administering the mRNA every 10 days, we can get significant survival. So to summarize, uh, for OTC deficiency, which I think will be uh, an example of what we will be seeing in other diseases, we not only have gene therapy, we have genome editing, and we may have mRNA therapy. So how does that all come together uh, in a clinical scenario, and how would they best be deployed? Well, in the late onset OTC deficient patients, uh, what we need is stable expression in a liver that's not dividing. I think the obvious approach is a one-time treatment with an AV gene replacement therapy, and that trial is underway under the auspices of Ultragenics. It's possible you could repeatedly administer the mRNA, but then it's like the hemophilia child where they keep getting this infusion of the mRNA. The most significant burden of disease is in the neonatal onset and in 50% mortality in the acute crisis. We need fast transient expression of OTC. I think mRNA is exquisitely positioned to do that. But when you get them over that crisis, they're at risk of having another crisis but you can stabilize them, and then we need durable correction from birth, and that's where genome editing would play a key role. AV gene replacement for an adult, later onset, mRNA for the acute crisis, and genome editing for more stable correction of treatment of a newborn. So as we think about different diseases, and as we progress these technologies, what we hope to do is leverage our experience in disease A across many other diseases. And as Jacob had suggested early, we are in a complete new era where I never would have thought, trust me, uh, five years ago that we'd even be in this position. I guess that's after 25 years of repeated failure, so you sort of get used to <laughs> managing your own expectations. So, so anyway, these are the people who primarily did, uh, did a lot of the work, uh, both at Penn, uh, Children's National, and then Moderna, who were collaborating with Messenger RNA. So thank you very much for your invitation and for your attention. Um, when I listen to lectures like what Dr. Wilson just gave, I, 
I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm left almost breathless with the scope and the implications of gene therapy on the future of medicine. Um, and I, I, it's a little overwhelming um, and just thinking through all the implications. But at the same time, um, it's so important to remember that, that these are implications that are gonna be on individual patients. Um, the philosopher Nikolai Berdyev talks about each person being a microcosm of the universe. And I come back to that concept a lot when I think about gene therapy because while it's so broad in its scope, um, the duty of medicine is gonna remain the same. Um, just like Dr. Toller said, the duty of medicine is still gonna be compassion for individuals. Um, and I'm also, as I do my advocacy work and as I talk to different patients and many of you up here on the panel as I've talked to you, um, I'm really intrigued by the um, the interplay of perceptions in the medical community and in patient advocacy groups. Um, sometimes when something's considered groundbreaking in medicine, I'm surprised by some of the very real legitimate hesitations in the patient community groups. Um, conversely, sometimes when I hear about things that are considered kind of small changes in the medical community, those can represent really huge um, quality of life advances for individual patients. So in that spirit, we wanted to invite individual patients um, whose lives can potentially will be directly impacted by gene therapy. We also wanna have Dr. Wilson stay up here to also field some of, um, some of the questions that might come up. Um, and our panel moderator, I'm gonna have to read to you about Patty because she's so accomplished. So our panel will be moderated by Patty Engel. Um, Patty really, to me, embodies someone who's worked to incorporate the patient perspective into medical advancement. That's really been the driving force in her career. Um, she began her professional career as an RN in pediatric oncology, where she worked firsthand with patients. Over the course of her career, she's become a pioneer in the rare disease space, conducting research that brings patient perspective to developers of orphan drugs. She's had roles in sales and marketing in multiple companies and has served on numerous nonprofit boards. She's currently the principal founder of Engage Health, a health research firm based here in the Twin Cities. Um, we know that gene therapy is very exciting and there's lots of, lots of facets. Lots of, I'm sure all of you are dying to ask questions. Um, but for the purpose of this panel, um, we really wanna keep the conversation really laser focused on the patient experience. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Patty. Well, thank you, Erica, and thank you to our panelists for your willingness to share your stories today. And as Dr. Holar talked about earlier today, part of the challenge of medicine, of course, is bringing the promise of science to patients and to deliver for patients what it is that is helpful. So that then turns the focus on all of you. Um, what is it about this that's helpful? Before we get going on the questions, though, I want to first introduce some of the panelists and have them introduce themselves, actually. And we're going to start with Ashante uh, De Silva. Me? This, okay. Uh, I'm Ashanti, and I'm the rare disease editor for The Mighty. Um, we're the largest digital health platform for people to connect with various conditions. Um, and we publish stories about what it's like to uh, live with rare diseases and, um, and chronic illness. And I believe I'm on the panel because in 1990, I was the first patient uh, to ever receive gene therapy at the National Institutes of Health. So that'll be a very helpful per perspective for us to hear about as we talk. Next is Mohammed Duklev. My name is Mohammed Duklev, and I'm here as a patient of a rare skin disease called Epidermolysis bullosa, or EB, the short name. I'm also a brother of three siblings with the same disease. Um, um, also, you know, as you know, EBs, as any um, rare disease, uh, doesn't have treatment or cure yet, and the only treatments are just uh, changing bandages and uh, treating infections every day. So we see the gene therapy as really a real help for treating this disease. Thank you, Mohammed. Next will be Jack Kaimal. Jack Kaimal, and I'm here today uh, to speak for my two sons that have a rare disease called GM2 gangliosidosis, or it's a hexosaminidase deficiency, or 
more simply called late onset Tay-Sachs disease. Okay. And uh, I, I thought I'd try to. Yeah, I think we have a little technical challenge. I don't think the slides are showing. Oh. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see the lovely pictures you sent. I know your children you can show us that. That's great. Thank you. Is that better? Very good. Yeah. And I'm sorry I couldn't, uh, they couldn't be here with me today. But they were uh, 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 born uh, back in 1983 and 1984, um, two adorable young boys. Um, they grew up uh, good students at school, very few uh, things that would indicate that they had an underlying disease. And then um, after a very successful school, in, uh, grade school and high school, they uh, went to college. Uh, my older son went to Notre Dame, and my younger son went to Syracuse. And uh, during their college years, they developed uh, uh, severe uh, depression, clinical depression, and uh, uh, episodes of mania that required hospitalization. It took us a number of years to eventually have them diagnosed. And uh, uh, that uh, psychiatric issues then evolved into uh, motor function uh, issues. And now uh, both my sons uh, have trouble with uh, mobility, as you can see from the slide at the, the left, which was taken just recently. And, uh, but they also suffer from uh, uh, swallowing uh, difficulties and speech impediment and a number of other uh, motor related issues. Okay. So I'm here speaking for them. Thank you, Jack. And our final panelist is Pam Mertz. Hi, um, Pam Mertz. I'm a mother of a son with cystic fibrosis and uh, uh, I'm here to share what it's like to have the hope uh, for gene therapy, uh, but also he, he is um, been able to have some medicines that have been developed that modify the protein defect and so um, somewhat stabilize the disease in, in that holding pattern, waiting for this gene therapy and the cure. Very good. So you can hear we have a number of different perspectives here. And just as Ashanti was a bit of a pioneer as one of the first uh, people to receive gene therapy, we're going to ask her to kind of kick off our panel. You know, Ashanti, as someone who has received gene therapy, can you describe for us what that was like in layman's terms? What, what was that about? Tell us about it. Um, sure. So the way I understand, I'll briefly describe what, um, how I, I guess what, what gene therapy is um, in layman's terms. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Wilson will, I don't know, it's, it's probably not going to be great. <laughs> but <laughs> sorry. Um, so if someone's born with a genetic mutation, um, that's causing a disease. Researchers and scientists can then um, s sort of take a virus and strip it of its, many of its infectious markers and insert the corrected genetic material into that. And like Dr. Wilson said, that is then called a vector and that's gonna be the mechanism of delivery for the corrected genetic material into the patient's cells. So once they can find a vector that's large enough um, for whatever condition, the cells, patients, uh, the patient cells are then taken, and uh, the virus will uh, insert the newly, uh, the, the corrected genetic material into that cell. Those cells are then returned to the patient, and uh, with hopes that you know, um, with this newly corrected genetic uh, information, no signs of the disease uh, will be found anymore, and hopefully that it's essentially a cure. Um, that, that, that's very that, helpful. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things I'm wondering about, you know, Muhammad, for example, as an adult who is considering that gene therapy may be avail available for your disease, what are some of the fears or issues that might need to be addressed by the medical community um, before they convince persons yeah. like yourself to become a pioneer yeah. and so, receive such a therapy? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, as, as um, an adult, um, you know, I can, you know, I can make like the uh, decision to uh, participate in any trial, but the problem that face um, most of EB patients that the criteria of inclusion and exclusion in any trial 
where sometimes like um, a treatment or a trial meant for a recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, but the criteria for inclusion uh, makes them unqualified, which is an example of me where, um, you know, I was, you know, I tried to participate in multiple clinical trials, and one of them is a gene therapy to um, put like skin grafts. Um, doctors see that I'm good, like candidate for the treatment based on diagnosis and the wounds that they have, but the issue that they have is that um, they have to, you know, follow the FDA's requirements to, you know, um, to be like as a, a candidate or to be included in the trial, which is, I think, the main issue that, um, you know, most EP patients have now, like, because we don't have any other trials or other hopes, like, the only, if we have a trial for any treatment, of course, we will participate, but it's not always like as the patient want. And the other thing I think it's important thing is to consider is the safety, especially for you know parents that of course they you know kind of concerned about their kids, that they have to make sure that this trial won't hurt their kid and will be safe and won't make more complications. So, yeah, I think. So there's those those considerations, you know, Pam. You have, um, you know, your situation is that in cystic fibrosis there are other therapies. So what kinds of different decision points does that lead you with when there's, there are some things you could do otherwise? Right. Um, yeah, as a, a parent, uh, there's lots of parents in this room that <laughs> you would jump at the chance to improve your child's health. And then you start to think about it, that for a second. Uh, wait a minute, what if, like you said, Mohammed, there's a complication that's even worse than what we've experienced? Um, what if we don't do this and therefore science is not advanced? And so it's, it's a very emotional, very charged decision um, to participate. Uh, my, my son has been in more clinical trials than, than we can count. And uh, he's now an adult. And when we took him to his last clinic, appointment. He said, I need to get there a half an hour early. I'm like, you're never early anywhere. What? He says, oh yeah, I signed up for another trial. <laughs> and I just got to sit there and watch him do this as an adult. And so he has stepped into that understanding um, the impact on the entire community that w we have to. We have to take that risk. We have to trust the medical community. We have to educate. We have to create awareness. Um, and it comes down to trusting that there's hope in that moment. Mm -hmm. Very good. Jack, a question for you. Since your um, sons have this disorder that is, you know, it's degenerative, right? Um, what kind of considerations are there when, when you know that certain things have, have degenerated to a certain point? Are there, are you hoping for regeneration of certain uh, or bringing back of certain capabilities? Or are you contemplating more the issues of just stopping progression of the disease? When my sons were first diagnosed with the disease, it, was, uh, it took us, uh, I'd say, about three years from the first serious manic episode that my sons had to uh, getting a diagnosis. And at that time, I uh, uh, was determined to try to find a, a cure. And, but the urgency didn't seem to be there because their disease is such a slow progressing disease. Um, um, you, d you don't see the decline day to day. You, you can look back over the years as I've shown in the photos and you can see the decline. And um, my, my sons, I've, you get used to the, their condition at any point in time, and uh, my fear is that their condition will continue to get worse. And so at this point, if there was a gene therapy, my hope would be that it simply stops the progression of the disease and that we don't see any additional decline. Mm -hmm. But then again, uh, there's always the hope that there's some reversal. And uh, just like allowing blind children to see and um, 
you're, you're hoping that there can be some uh, regeneration or over time to, to uh, uh, have them regain some of their speech ability would be wonderful to allow them to um, uh, just do a few of the things that they used to be able to do. Uh, but our hope is that primarily that the gene therapy would just stop the progression of the disease and not let it go any further. Dr. Wilson, that leads me to a question for you. Um, in some of the animal data that you showed, it looked like there was a return of motor function. Now, when we think about gene therapy, should families be thinking about stopping progression, or should we be thinking about improvements in certain functional abilities for some of these therapies, or is that all yet to be determined? Well, there are some, <clears throat> it's all based on what uh, the understanding of the disease, and that's uh, a combination of uh, human data and animal data. Uh, the, the number of diseases where it's clear that if, you're, if you correct the gene that you would regain significant function is a minority. Um, with that said, um, there are, we've had some surprises in animals where you would expect that reconstituting expression should only stop the further degeneration and you regain function. Mm -hmm. So I, um, uh, and boy, if that happened, that'd be great. <laughs> that'd be great. First of all, it'd be easy to know it worked. Yes. Right? Because <laughs> as opposed yeah. to wait for something not to happen. Right. So, uh, so we kind of look for those, but I, you know, the way that I, I, you can't promise it for sure unless the disease, unless the, mechanism would really suggest that. Okay. Uh, but I think w we've been in for some surprises. And the regain in function that we've seen in some of these settings is not all the way back to where you started, but, but modest improvements mm -hmm. in, uh, in certain neurologic uh, motor mm -hmm. uh, aspects. Um, but, 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 um, but we usually, unless that's very clear, the, the expectation would be that you stop further, okay. further loss of function. Another question for you, Dr. Wilson. You know, we've heard a little bit from, from Pam about, you know, you really sit back and think. You know, when, it, when really you finally have this therapy you've been hoping for, you sit back and think and think, should we do this? And in that comment, Pam, it made me think about somewhere in the back of your mind was something maybe about safety or side effects or, you know, what are we going to experience? Maybe the unknown. Um, what... Dr. Wilson, are your thoughts about the safety of gene therapy? Right. Um, well, um, you know, first of all, if, if it hasn't been tested in humans, monkeys, dogs, monkey, uh, mice notwithstanding, we don't know what the safety is, bottom line, because there have been so many surprises. So, so with that said, where I tend to gravitate in bringing sort of a new concept, a new platform, into human trials are diseases for which uh, the, the need is, is very high, mm -hmm. that the mortality would be in, in years to months. Um, and, and so if uh, and the risk and the benefit profile is, is much uh, better. The one that, thing that's nice about gene therapy, let's say AV9 into the brain, mm -hmm. we'll say, is that if you can show it works in disease A, and you know what the safety is, that you can leverage that experience with that same approach for disease B, C, D, and E. And, but small molecules aren't like that. This small molecule is completely different than the next one, and each has to be evaluated on its own merit. So I suggest, you know, getting back to sort of your comments, as I think about the broader layout, let's go for the diseases, maybe the more severe form uh, of the disease, uh, because the need is there, yeah. and the risk benefit would be better. Mm -hmm. And then once we show uh, that there's a path forward, we could leverage that to the patients mm -hmm. uh, for which uh, maybe the clock isn't ticking so fast. Yeah, it's a great point. And I'm going to go backwards to um, some pictures to ask Ashanti a question. Um, you talked, Dr. Wilson, about that risk benefit, and Ashanti is one of the you know first recipients of gene therapy for. Uh, ADA, uh, skid ADA. Um, I'm not sure if people in the audience know what that is, but could you speak a little bit about 
the risk that you were looking at as a small child, um, and, but also then what the, the benefit in your, from your perspective has been. How has it changed your life? Uh, sure. I, um, so I, I have skid ADA, that's severe combined immunodeficiency, and ADA uh, is the enzyme that I'm missing um, to essentially build a functioning immune system. Um, so I was born in 86. I was very lucky, lucky to even get diagnosed um, at two years of age. Um, and I'll just tell this story quickly because I do want patients and families to have um, some sense of hope. Uh, so at the time, the only thing that was available when I was diagnosed was enzyme replacement therapy. And after about two years, I started to you know, quickly decline again. I was catching a lot of infections and I was sort of slipping away. And uh, my doctor, who diagnosed me, sent some blood to the NIH. And um, he said, you know, there may be this trial, and they're focusing on skid ADA. You know, who knows, maybe in her lifetime. And uh, so my parents, you know, they sent the blood. And my father is like, this is never going to happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> because that's the case with many of these trials, especially when it's so experimental. Um, they never come into fruition. Uh, but we were very lucky that my, uh, my cells were a good candidate um, for the first gene therapy trial. And what happened was my parents met with these researchers and scientists at the NIH uh, for months. And um, they, we, we had nothing to go off of since this was the first trial in the world. Um, and the researchers were also very willing to talk to my parents um, to explain it as much as they could, um, even a lot of, it, I'm sure, went over my parents' heads, but they tried their best to, um, you know, understand it, and they asked tons of questions, um, which I encourage all of you to do. Um, so we knew the risks. The risks for my parents were that I could develop leukemia, um, and if the gene inserted itself in the wrong position, um, you know, I, I, there was also, also the possibility of death. Um, but when you have a rare disease, you don't have a lot of options, as many of you know. Um, and I was slipping away, so, you know, after talking and really, we built a lot of trust um, with the doctors at the NIH, and I think that's very important um, to build a relationship, build some trust, um, and then you sort of uh, just go for it. And, um, you know, the first trials, they ran my infusions back very slowly. <laughs> they held my hands uh, throughout the whole thing um, because it's like sort of the whole world was watching to see what was going to happen. Um, and they were very cautious. I, I still remained on enzyme replacement therapy um, because just in case, um, you know, this didn't work and it didn't fully work. It wasn't a full cure as they had hoped for. Um, if you read those clinical journals, a lot of doctors today will say maybe that was a failure. Um, but because I, I was um, regressing, my parents would say that it, it, it saved my life. Um, so I think it's very difficult for a lot of the patients and families in, these, in this room and uh, you know, around the world to have to make these kind of decisions. Um, Patty, as you said, that's a lot of uh, worrying and you, you, you love your child, you don't know what's gonna happen, but you also, you wanna try. Um, so I commend all of you and I hope that um, you'll be confident enough to ask as many questions as possible and, and build trust with your, the teams that you're working with um, and try. That's very good. You know, um, you bring up an interesting point and Dr. Wilson, your presentation um, touched on it as well. Um, you know, in those cases where maybe it doesn't work or the or the benefit is not maintained over time as long as we would like, um, we've heard patients ask, well, can't I get it again? Or can't I get another kind of gene therapy? And that leads me to think about a situation like an epidermal lysis below some Muhammad, where let's pretend, you know, there's lots of companies working on different kinds of gene therapy. As a patient, how do you decide between them, you know, is there any indication of which one's going to really work because just in case I can't get it again, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, for as someone with this um, skin disorder, I don't have more options to choose. But if, like, there are two companies are working on the same disease, and if the mechanism of action 
for treating the type of EBR the same, I will choose the one that um, has the, uh, the best delivery method of that treatment. Um, for example, you know, um, like most of EP have like, um, you know, open wounds and like entire their body is like affected. So, you know, now there are either two ways of treatment, either topically or using skin grafts or some of them now by injecting the therapy into the skin. So in my case, if there are two like companies, one of them, you know, topical, the other, the other injection, I will choose the, in, uh, I'm sorry, if one of them is the uh, graft and the other injection, I will use the injection um, just because um, in my type or my case, I have very large open wounds and by doing skin graft, it's, it's really difficult because if you have like um, wounds in, in in places that really hard to keep your graft on, like most of the like, you know, you have to keep the graft on the skin for you know, weeks or days without even changing the dressings. And most EP patients, like, and I'm one of them, I have to change dressings every day. So, like, if I'm gonna keep that graft without changing the dressing, it's really you know challenging for me. So for me, I think the injection is better because you just inject on the wound side and you don't have to deal with the other issues like, you know, um, that I think, um, um, you know, gonna be really challenging for adults or for, you know, children because it's, um, that's, that's how I, I can like, um, you know, choose between companies and other thing I will consider is like, you know, because if you're gonna travel to another state or another city, you're gonna consider the, you know, travel expenses, uh, you know, hotels and all these. If the company will cover that, will m make my decision easier. But if, you know, you have to pay out of your pocket, it will be really difficult where I have to choose the one that really more affordable and, you know, and it, more consideration even for families that because they have a lot of um, like wound supplies they have to carry on with them to the location that they want to do the trial at. So, you know, many uh, like uh, points they have to look at to make their decision on which one they have to choose. Yeah. So for you, it sounds like it's more pragmatic issues such as delivery or ease of participating in the trial. Um, for the rest of the panelists, Jack, what do you think about that? Would those be your biggest considerations or would you be looking more at trying to guess which one might be more effective or something like that? It would be nice to have a choice of <laughs> yeah, which clinical it? trial to get into. <laughs> My two sons are probably two of 200 individuals yeah. in the United States that have the same, this disease, yeah. late onset Tay-Sachs disease. And um, my major concern is just finding uh, clinical centers or mm -hmm. researchers that would be interested in pursuing a gene therapy for their mm -hmm. form of the disease. Yeah. And uh, the other part of it is to, if you, uh, trying to sponsor someone to do that, it's extremely expensive to develop yes. a gene therapy from scratch for uh, a new clinical trial. You bring up such an interesting point. And Dr. Wilson, you mentioned in your talk that uh, you, know, you wouldn't have imagined five years ago that there'd be this many trials, this many companies pursuing uh, gene, therapy, gene therapies in the clinic. Is there advice that you can give to parents and people running patient organizations um, about how do you get this together? How do we get these, the amazing work in the scientific side of things to connect out, to get funded, to uh, get connected then with commercial developers um, who will hopefully eventually bring these to the bedside? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> I'm not sure this is what you want to hear, but um, um, we suffered early on, like any emerging technology, where the expectations were unrealistic. And at the turn of the century, with certain toxicities, that led to a substantial loss of support for the field. My, my concern now 
is we're suffering a little bit of irrational exuberance. Okay. And so my heads up is not everyone who proposes there to do something uh, is appropriate or justified. Um, and, um, and it's hard to ferret out uh, those issues. Yeah. They're, they're, they're scientifically nuanced, but maybe I have the perspective of 35 years, so, so I can usually smell it out pretty easily. Yeah. But, but I, uh, I think we've overreacted a bit. Okay. Uh, and it's been driven by all the same sort of <clears throat> drivers that drove it before. Uh, and, um, and so I would, I would um, how do you do it? You know, um, you, you know, you have physicians who, who, who take care of you, but just because someone says that they want to do something doesn't mean that they should be doing it. That's a great there point. are gates, FDA and others. FDA looks at safety issues. Um, and if there's so much going on, if, if you're in a situation where a year game over, then that's different than wait, ask questions, yeah. find some good advisors who are not just there to say yes, but to ask some really, really probing, probing questions. And I, I would just be careful. Yeah, it's great advice. I think of organizations like the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation who has a great deal of resource medical advisors has the ability to to decide about what they're going to put their funds behind because they are advised by uh, people who know these things but there's many associations that people in the audience represent that may be a couple families around a kitchen table and um, you know Pam can you comment on that a little bit about how do patient associations make decisions about if the science is sound enough to support well, that's a that's a tall order because yeah. you know patients and families. Um, you know, we have the lived experience, but we don't have the clinical experience. So I, I think it's it's both and, not either or. And um, you know, the foundation is the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is is pretty forward thinking in terms of changing the care model, and including parents and patients and families in their quality improvement initiatives, uh, putting them in paid positions, in the clinics out there. Um, also, for some of the smaller organizations, um, you know, we're we're a small disease. We're 30,000 patients, but um, we were blessed enough to have a, a leader at the top, Dr. Bob Bell, who who invented the term venture philanthropy, found some drug companies and invested in them rather than just giving them money, and um, we hit a home run. Well, maybe a double. It's not quite a home run yet. <laughs> and um, have been able to, to reap some rewards from that and just manage those hard-earned dollars for walking and dancing and climbing and all the things that we do to raise every dollar. So I want to give everyone else out there hope that um, we just keep doing what we're doing, just take the next step, because there's, there's good things happening. We can hear that. Out of curiosity of our panelists, I know, Pam, you're very involved in the, in the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, we've talked a little bit about decision making on an individual basis. Um, for the rest of you, how have you been involved in the overall association for your disease? And if so, has that been helpful that in helping you think about treatment options or um, trial participation options? Yeah, um, I mean, for uh, epidermolysis below, so we have this charity, Deborah. Um, which is a worldwide organization and has branches in over uh, in over in much of uh, every country and the good thing about the organization is try to gather uh, all patients families doctors everyone who like um, affected with the disease or interested in investing in like in investing or uh, finding a treatment to collect them together and they are the great resource for um, like um, providing patients with clinical trials that are going around the world. Like if a trial happening in Minnesota, they will tell patients there is a, a trial opening if someone is interested in enrolling. And they try to connect all patients and provide them with all uh, resources so make, that makes them, you know, makes things easier for them so they can participate. So I think 
you know, they are really helpful, and these organizations, you know, makes the, you know, give the support to our community. Do you believe that your patient organizations for each of your respective diseases are helping to somewhat manage that exuberance that Dr. Wilson spoke to? Yeah, Ashanti, how about you? Uh, sure. So uh, my patient organization is the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and I feel like they've done a fabulous job um, of sort of helping people to remain optimistic and know what their options are, but still uh, cautious as well. Um, I'm a part of a few uh, groups of those, um, a small groups of, of these patients um, and families uh, who have SCID. And if anyone has any questions, hey, I, my child was newly diagnosed because now we have newborn screening in all 50 states, which is amazing. Um, but my child was new, newly diagnosed and I'm deciding between you know, bone marrow transplant or gene therapy. And um, there's just a, a wealth of information of other families who have gone through these same decisions and can give um, names of trusted doctors, um, how the processes are different from uh, you know, one trial in maybe North Carolina to a trial in California, um, and, and really help them uh, make better decisions. So I think it's so important if you have, <clears throat> if you're considering any of, the, of these transformative therapies to connect with uh, your patient organization and see how they can help and connect you with other families. Dr. Wilson, your comments made me think, um, you know, you said just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. And um, I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about where you believe gene therapy will end up fitting into practice guidelines um, for different diseases. Is it disease dependent, do you think, or, or what? Well, well, let's say we sort of overcome and define uh, the technical barriers, so you're asking me to think a little bit True. <laughs> in the future, uh, then there will always be a defined set of risks that are going to be um, real, uh, or, um, and we won't uh, really completely know what all the risks are. The bottom line is the risk of gene therapy, which you've durably, sustainably changed something, is always going to be higher than a pill that you can quit taking. And, and so I think it's going to be a while before uh, gene therapy uh, gets more mainstream in terms of less severe diseases. So I think it'll always be, at least in the next 10, 20 years, and editing is a, it's, it's a next version with an additional set of, of concerns that don't exist for gene therapy, always in diseases for which the, meet, the need is greatest and the tolerance for risk would be, would be greater. Um, in terms of the, 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 the targets, you know, the eye, um, the liver, um, the central nervous system is where the largest burden of uh, morbidity and mortality is in genetic diseases. Uh, some of those are more amenable than others. Um, and, and muscular diseases, we've heard a lot of interesting data recently on Duchenne's as being potentially tractable. Um, I've always... Uh, known and studied epidermolysis bullosa since I was a, a young physician, and it always seemed to me the skin is accessible. Uh, so uh, I'm really, really, really hopeful that, that something's going to happen. There's a lot of people getting into it, which is good. Can I, can I just make one comment, though, about, <clears throat> about something that, um, about eligibility? And, and, and this is really challenging, because w I'm involved in those decisions. And when you begin in a disease, uh, there are ser several factors that you consider, uh, both in terms of trying to as expeditiously seek approval for the drug as well as deal with the concerns of the regulators. Mm -hmm. And that frequently goes to those that are most severe, in which mm -hmm. the natural history is most predictable and the unmet need is the greatest, who generally is left out are adults with the disease, time and time again. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and, it, and, it, and, and, and if the disease in its, in its severe form is lethal, the prevalent population are adults. <laughs> so it just, it just, uh, it's just an artifact of, of uh, where we are early. Uh, and, um, and the hope is that there are paths forward to expand the access to adults. For example, 
what happened with an antisense oligonucleotide for SMA from Biogen. It's called Spinraza. The trials were done in the more severe form. Mm -hmm. There weren't even trials done yeah. in the less severe form, and FDA expanded its access to, uh, you know, to others. But, but, but this, um, this is, it troubles us, and I can understand those parents or, or uh, individuals living with the adult form uh, feel left out. Yeah. Um, it brings up a question that as um, we've ha I've had the opportunity to speak to a number of our panelists uh, privately, and many of you have brought up this issue of who chooses. You know, am in a clinical trial, of course, the inclusion and exclusion criteria really, as you describe, Mohammed, uh, determine if you can be in a trial or not. And usually those are very tight, of course, so that a drug can get approved and then be available. But once available, that label might be very narrow then, as you described, Dr. Wilson, and then is it your insurance company who decides? Is it you as a parent who decides? Is it the doctor who decides? Or practice guidelines? Um, you know, Jack, what do you think about that as you contemplate the future? Well, um, my concern is um, based upon the gene therapies that are approved now, uh, Luxturna for the treatment of the eye disease that was talked about earlier today, I believe has a cost of um, $900,000. And I can't remember if that's per eye or is it for, for both eyes? 350 per injection. Per, per injection. Yeah. And uh, my concern is uh, not just who decides who gets it, but who's going to pay for it, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's um, foundation supported or uh, uh, insurance supported or government supported mm -hmm. um, because the individuals that have these diseases obviously they're incapacitated and they don't have the the financial means to pay for the their cure mm -hmm. and so I think that's the big dilemma with gene therapy where insurance companies are based upon year-to-year -year premiums and yet you're talking about a therapy that'll last them the rest of their lives mm -hmm. and uh, it'll be a very difficult transition as we go from um, therapies that are given continuously to one-time treatments. Mm -hmm. We've talked to the um, organizers of our program today already thinking about next year and we said we could probably do about a three-day session on pricing and payments and coverage but you bring up an excellent point if my insurance company today pays for this and ten years from now the result is no longer durable, uh, and I'm with a different insurance company by then, what happens? You know, um, we've seen some interesting things about some very creative pricing schemes that are being put together, but they're all yet to be determined. Um, we're truly at the infancy, so. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, the, you know, I mean, the comment, I, we, we have tried to get ahead of this a little, yeah. but, um, but I, 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 I'm really worried about it. I mean, five years ago, 10 years ago, no pharma was interested in rare diseases. None. It, it, it was depressing and, and uh, now they're interested. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure why. But, but, but there is to an extent, I mean, you say that, but if the reimbursement is it's a very fragile situation that could go away pretty quickly. Yes, it is. If, uh, and, so, and so I worry about safety and efficacy, but what really worries me, if, there's, if there is uh, underwhelming reimbursement, mm -hmm. I can tell you they're gonna walk away from it. That's true. So, uh, so I, um, I hope we figure it out. <laughs> yeah. It, it strikes me that those issues are not just, um, you know, with gene therapy. They're with many complex therapies, obviously. Um, you know, as we address those things, what can, what can we all do? You know, Erica talked about the, her efforts to, you know, get some legislative change here in the state of Minnesota to establish a rare disease council. But really, you know, we all do worry about that. But what can we do besides worry? What can we do to move the conversation forward to some solutions. 
thoughts? Um, I, I am on enzyme replacement therapy and it's one of the most expensive drugs in the world. Um, so this isn't speaking to gene therapy, but it, you know, a, a very expensive drug, a tier four drug as insurance companies uh, like to label them. Um, I've realized that a lot of <clears throat> my fellow rare disease advocates, um, we, we don't always know what's available and I believe that every pharmaceutical company um, who is making drugs for rare diseases that are going to be you know, astronomically expensive, they have a responsibility to set up a patient assistance program um, to help these families uh, cover these drugs, these life-saving drugs. Um, so I always encourage, if I'm meeting a new, um, you know, if I meet new people and they're like, you know, I, I also have a tier four drug and I don't think there's anything I can do, I say, um, you know, look into it, look into these patient assistance programs. They're not going to be well advertised, <laughs> unfortunately, but literally just Google your condition, the drug and patient assistance programs and see what is out there. Um, there's, a, um, there's PSI, there's Patient Services Incorporated. Um, there's the National Organization for Rare Diseases that also has some patient assistance programs. Um, don't, in my uh, experience, don't just take the insurance company's word, well, you have to pay it, there's no other option. Look into your options. Um, again, ask your patient organizations for what's available. Um, your financial stability is of utmost importance. Um, so I, I just encourage you to connect and, and see what's available. Go ahead, Pam. And I'd like to speak to that too. Um, those patient assistant programs are amazing and wonderful. Uh, my son's drugs are $40,000 a month um, to be healthy and go to college. And it's not being sick. Um, but a lot of insurance companies are now exercising copay accumulators. If you haven't heard that term, check it out. That means, yes, we'll take that money from that patient assistance program, but not apply it to your deductible. Right? Right. So um, I'm working hard to get legislation uh, here in Minnesota. Arizona is the first state to do it, to push back on that. Um, but we, we have to speak out. There's got to be a way to share this cost because there are contributing members of society up here that deserve the right to be able to have the drugs that have been developed by everybody doing our you know, grassroots fundraising. That's a great point. Very good point. I'd, I'd like to also open the, the questions up to the audience. Um, go ahead. Follow up with a strategy. Um, the pharmaceutical companies are interested in rare diseases, but they're interested in rare diseases that have manifestations that are milder and more prevalent throughout the greater population. And so one of the strategies, particularly companies like Pfizer, are looking at rare diseases and looking for symptoms that the kinds of problems, typical, more serious patients looking for advanced therapies are going through that might have thousands of other patients that have more minor symptoms. And an area that I would suggest you work in is lobbying for the fact that these companies that are developing these pool capital for the more severe manifestations of diseases and allow an opportunity from their profits where they're looking at where similar manifestations exist over broader populations. And if anybody's interested, I'll be glad to discuss what those specific things are. But it's really an important distinction. I think you need to challenge the pharmaceutical industry with regard to their selectivity regarding rare diseases and, and the issue that I just raised. It's a great point. It's a great point. Others, other comments or questions? Thank you. Um, Ashanti, it's so good to see you here. Welcome, uh, welcome. thank you for coming. Uh, and you already answered part of my question. I was wondering what your treatment was subsequent to the gene therapy. Uh, and um, uh, because your therapy was ADA gene transfer into the differentiated T cells, so it wasn't really theoretically expected that it was going to be curative for the most part. Um, what I'm wondering about now is um, now the gene therapy for ADA deficiency goes into hematopoietic stem cells and from the evidence that we've seen, this is curative. What's your perspective on that, and are you thinking about getting another treatment? Thank you. Um, I am so excited to see gene therapy come full circle for Skid ADA. Um, I, I can't believe I'm seeing it in my lifetime because we've had quite a bit of setbacks when it's come to when it's come to gene therapy. Um, so, I think the new the lentivirus. 
uh, that's out there now that hopefully uh, Orchard Therapeutics will bring to the FDA for approval in the U.S. soon. Um, I, I, it looks like it could be a full cure, and, and that's unbelievable. Um, for me, I am, I've talked to uh, some of the researchers at the NIH, and I'm not sure if I would be a candidate for the new lentivirus um, gene therapy um, if they decide to do an adult trial. Uh, what I would like to say um, in this regards to, to gene therapy and being a transformative therapy uh, for anyone with a rare disease, um, when it comes to something like my condition, it used to be believed that it was only an immune deficiency, that it only affected your immune system. Over 30 years of research um, you know, that I've participated in at the NIH, they found out that it's really more of a metabolic syndrome. It affects many parts of your body, and I think that's true of a lot of people with rare diseases. Um, so while gene therapy might look like, you know, a cure for a skid ADA uh, as far as the immune system, um, some of them are still having metabolic conditions or issues with their lungs, um, things like still de developing diabetes. So I would like to see us, regardless of whether adults um, who are going to be living with skid ADA um, after receiving gene therapy um, are eligible for, for newer trials if it hasn't worked, I would like to see them have uh, that transition into adult care um, and be followed continuously because these conditions where children were once dying and, and you know, not living very long, we didn't know the progression. When you study these patients over a long period of time, you can understand the full progression of these conditions that we really don't know much about when it comes to rare diseases. So as long as I can keep on being followed, I'm very appreciative of that. Dr. Williams, once the gene therapy procedure has been performed, what is the span of time that until you see improvement in that patient? Well, there, there are two aspects. How long would it take to see whether it works? That's very much disease specific. If, if it's a degenerative disease that's slow and you stop degeneration, it could take you a long time. So rather than this, you're seeing this. If you regain function, you could see it in two days. So that's very much a function of whatever the particular disease is. The other question that's often asked is how long will it last? Because you can only follow dogs for 12 years, which we have, and it lasts for 12 years, but humans live longer than 12 years. Mm -hmm. and, and this is kind of the, the, the frontier. We don't know how long it's gonna last, but if you look at the, in the brain, for example, in, in dogs and monkeys, five to 10 years, and it doesn't go down. So that may suggest it could be much longer than that in the liver, 10 years in a dog or 15 years in a monkey. But we really don't know how long, whether this will last. And it's likely at some point you're going to need to have another treatment, I would suspect. I'm assuming that it would be a lot quicker in the younger the person is because of the, quick, the quickly, rapidly dividing cells. Is that correct or not? The... Um, for the more severely affected diseases, the history of the disease is faster. So the patients get sicker quicker, so it's easier to see whether there's an effect than a, a more slowly progressive disease. So it's one of the reasons why the more affected young patients are subject to clinical trials. So you could actually demonstrate whether it works or not, which is obviously a requirement of the FDA. Do we expect, do, does it, I'd like to hear the panel's thoughts about um, something that, Mohammed you spoke to a little bit in about getting therapy. Um, do, what are your thoughts about where gene therapy would be given? Would there be centers of excellence established? Would there have to be some certification or something for you to be involved? I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? I think, um the most important thing is that any researcher or a doctor is better to be involved in that disease to understand, you know, how, like, the complications are developed, how, you know, like, how they, they like, they can see the patients more closely, which makes it easier for them to understand how they can treat that 
disease or that condition and how, uh, what are the complications that they can develop from that. So I think it will be more easier if, uh, you know, researcher has like deep researches or history of researches on that particular disease. Mm -hmm. Are any of your patient organizations getting involved at this point to work with uh, centers to help them be prepared um, to give some of the more complex therapies? And do you see things esta being established from an infrastructure standpoint? Uh, Jack, well, anything in your disease in that regard? Ultra rare diseases, which you know, I'd say that's where you have less than a thousand patients worldwide. I don't know if that's the correct definition of ultra rare, but um, it it takes a lot to understand the disease and the, the therapy, especially if it's a complex procedure for delivery of the therapy. And uh, my vision would be that there would only be a few centers worldwide for certain diseases where they can really uh, uh, do an outstanding job of the delivering the therapy. And uh, certainly I would think that University of Minnesota should be one of those. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> so I'm getting the sign that our time yeah, is... One more, one more question. Let's take that and then we'll wrap it up. First of all, thank you for putting on today. I come from a researcher standpoint, so this was very eye-opening for me. One question that I have is probably very naive, which is I've heard a lot today about not only the cost of research, the cost of therapies, but also a lot about these individual patient advocacy groups, which for those of us studying rare diseases, often we're reliant on you all for our funding because this isn't being funded very well at a national level. So beyond today and here, is there a group of people that work for rare diseases? Because like you say, an ultra rare disease has a thousand patients, but if we combine all of the rare diseases, we're actually quite a powerful body. So is there a group that's working on a national level to encourage the NIH to fund these diseases or how do we get that going? Maybe. I just don't know, it's probably a naive question. <laughs> Uh, I would, I I would turn know. the answer of that over to Erica Barnes from Nord, actually. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that we prioritize in our advocacy are issues like um, a lot of what you've heard about today, gene therapy funding, funding for NIH, funding for FDA, making sure that patient voices are heard across um, the medical enterprise, the research enterprise, and making sure that you all have um, have a voice as a group because alone we're rare, but together we're strong. So there's a lot that you all can do um, and feel free, Nord's website has a contact form. I have plenty of business cards. So if anyone wants you know, my particular information, I'm happy to help you connect with the folks at Nord who are best suited to address what you're looking to solve. Very good, thank you. You know, as they say, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a step, and I really appreciate the participation of our panelists and really the university for putting this together. It's a wonderful step to bring together all of the groups. Um, with that, I understand that Linda Wellich, the Dean of the College of Pharmacy, is going to shortly here announce the recipients of the research awards, and then there'll be some closing comments. So thank you so much for your participation. But I will say, um, again, it's been a tremendous day. I'll save my closing comments for a minute. I want to thank everyone who's here, but I also want to specifically talk about what I've been asked to is the research awards. And I would say, if you look at all the posters out there, thank you all for submitting them and presenting on them. You're all winter winners, but we couldn't stay here and present everyone one by one. Hopefully everybody did that as they walk through and talk to the various investigators. I first want to thank our judges um, for the Rare Disease Research Awards, and their names are shown on the slides, but include Mahmoud Al Kafahi, um, Abby Hauser, Robert Cryo, um, Walter Lowe, Stacy Pike, and Kiki Safa, Safa Glue. And I apologize on the last name on the last one. Um, I would like everybody to give the judges. Um, a round of applause.
Because if you looked at the posters out there, that wasn't an easy job to do, right? Besides reading all those, they really had to think through which one was the best, and because there are only three awards. And so now, as I present these three awards, I'd like the individuals to come forward, and I will give them their certificate and a gift card. And then I'd like to ask them to stay on stage um, until we get all three um, recipients up here. Um, and our first um, award goes to Irene Vu. She's an experimental clinical pharmacology graduate student in the College of Pharmacy. Um, her work is entitled Intermuscular versus Intravenous Elpregnolone Pharmacokinetics and Safety in Dogs for the Early Treatment of Status Epiglasticus. And so... <laughs> it's with great, great pleasure I present you this award. Congratulations. Our next award goes to Sarah Kim, um, an experimental clinical pharmacology graduate student who did a review of immune tolerizing regimens for in vivo gene therapy. Sarah. And our last um, recipient is Alfroz Mohammed. He is a pharmaceutics postdoctoral fellow, and his work was entitled Brain Distribution of Third Generation Tapa Isomerases um, Inhibitors Implications in the Treatment of Brain Tumors. And as he gets up there, maybe we can get a picture of all of them up there, as um, well as please give them again a round of applause. <laughs> and I think the Rare Disease Day and Conference is a wonderful tradition um, with the College of Pharmacy and the Stem Cell Institute and the other partners. But, and I'm proud of that, but what I'm more proud of and I want to stay committed to as a College of Pharmacy, but I hope you all stay committed to, the way this work has to move forward is a collective. It is not about drugs in the College of Pharmacy or about medicine and caring. It's about both of those, but it's also about policy, advocacy, and our groups, um, patient advocate groups. It's about patients. It's about their family. It's about our hopes and dreams for a better tomorrow. And I mean that very sincerely, even though it may sound very broad and general today. Um, I think we all have to remain committed to the future and working together. And I look forward to doing that. And I look forward to the discussions. We've already heard about maybe what next year's agenda will bring. I don't know if we can go to three days. But, <laughs> but we do have to tackle all those tough issues that are in front of us. Um, so thank you, and now I'm gonna turn it over um, to Dr. Cloyd um, for his final remark. I want the people in the front of the room to look behind you so you can see that this uh, conference room is virtually full. We had in excess of 270 registrants, and many of you braved the weather and the unplowed streets to make it here today, and for that we are grateful. This is the seventh annual meeting. The first one was held at the Ball of America, where we had uh, children and their families, primarily from Gillette, come over to the Ball of America. We had a few discussions, and then we made arrangements for all the kids to get on the rides uh, at the Mall of America. We may try to do that again for young and older kids. <laughs> it... Uh, Somebody once said it takes a village to raise a child, and it, uh, in a rare event, it takes a community to move things ahead. And look at this room today. We have members of the community here, families, patient advocacy representatives, members of the healthcare organizations across the Twin Cities, representatives from the biomedical industry, and indeed academicians, including researchers, teachers, trainees, and together, we have moved the needle. And if that wasn't clear before, it certainly is now that we've heard the presentations 
from Dr. Wilson and the discussions by the panelists. So I think it's reasonable to look forward to the future. Today, uh, we had 41 poster presentations. We had uh, 19 patient advocacy organizations and 12 sponsors. And I just want to take a moment to thank a few of the people that are responsible for the success of today. So these are our sponsors. Uh, if you haven't already stopped by their exhibits, please do so and say thank you because they made this possible in so many ways. I want to thank our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Wilson, who did a superb job of helping us understand what the state of the art is today and where we might be going in the future. And for the panelists, for your uh, thoughtful and insightful comments, honest, sometimes painful, but certainly directing us to move ahead. And that, too, has been of great value to this community. And then lastly, uh, a great deal of thanks goes to the com planning committee. They're listed here. And uh, I can see that uh, there's a name in the middle, Lori Inslee. I had highlighted that and put an asterisk behind it. But then I gave it to Lori to put on the computer. And I see some gene editing took place. <laughs> Lori Inslee was the program coordinator for this. And if things went smoothly, it's largely because she did a superb job of putting this together. And for that, I would ask that you thank the planning committee for the work. And the many of you in this room who represent patient advocacy organizations, many of you showed up today. Uh, your interactions have been fruitful and productive. I hope there's been some interaction with other groups, whether they are patient advocacy organizations or perhaps University of Minnesota staff or trainees. But lay that groundwork for further collaboration.